Greetings, scientists. It's Mr. Gopal here. Uh, we've been talking a lot about bonding, and today is no different. I'm going to talk about two different kinds of covalent bonds, specifically polar and nonpolar. Now, when you hear those words, hopefully you think to yourselves, poles, all right? Uh, and we might think of the North, Stole and the, uh, North Pole and the South Pole, uh, which are at completely different ends of the Earth, okay? Uh, and so also when you think about poles, you want to think about attraction when it comes to chemistry. And here's why. Well, before I get to that, let's uh, identify the lesson. Uh, the focus question is how do we determine if a covalent bond is polar or nonpolar? Uh, and to circle back to what I said about attraction, what we want to be thinking about is the fact that certain elements are more attracted to electrons and others less so. Uh, we call those um, attractions when they appear in bonds and they affect different elements in the bonds unequally, we call these bonds polar covalent bonds. So the first resource that I have for you is just a little bit of background. Uh, and so I say that covalent bonds uh, involve the sharing of electrons between atoms of elements that have different electronegativities. This occurs sometimes, particularly when they are asymmetrical and um, they involve uh, elements, uh, different elements. The inequalities can create poles where parts of the bonds are more negatively charged and other parts are more positively charged. So we have an illustration of that here. We usually use um, this Greek symbol here to show that in the case of this bond between hydrogen and fluorine, fluorine is a very high electronegativity. Uh, hydrogen has a very low electronegativity. It's ready to give up um, the electrons a little bit more easier than fluorine is because fluorine is so close to that eighth electron that will complete its octet. As a result, if you can picture it, the electrons being shared between the hydrogen and fluorine that are represented by that line are being pulled closer to the fluorine. Um, and so this creates what we call a polar bond. On the other hand, we have some bonds like this, which I put in our resource as well, where even though carbon is attracting the electrons a little bit closer to it than hydrogen, it's happening on all four sides. So there's a symmetry here in the pulling, and there is no region that is more particularly more um, negatively charged and more positively charged. Back to the resource. Uh, so I, I give you a little bit of background on covalent bonds. And then we have these definitions. So as I said, a, a covalent bond where electrons are pulled more towards one region, uh, that's a polar covalent bond. Uh, and a nonpolar covalent is where electrons are pulled in all directions equally, resulting in a uniform charge. There's no part that's more negative. There's no part that's more positive. Uh, so uh, in addition to the lesson, which is great, I just wanted to go through some basic rules for identifying polar versus nonpolar. So we're looking for asymmetry if we're identifying a polar bond, and we're looking for symmetry uh, if we're identifying a nonpolar bond. Now, specifically with nonpolar, we're looking for symmetry in a horizontal, sorry, a horizontal and a vertical direction as well. We're also looking for electronegativity consistency. So with the example that I gave with CH4, there's a consistent electronegativity difference on all four sides. Other examples that we'll see are bonds between atoms of the same element. There's no electronegativity difference between them, or you could say the difference between the electronegativities of two hydrogen atoms, for example, or fluorine atoms or oxygen atoms is zero because they have the same electronegativity. So when we subtract the electronegativity of one atom from the other, we get zero. And so if that's the case, if we have elements of the same bond, or sorry, this, uh, elements, uh, atoms of the same element, then we know that um, there's no difference. So there's not gonna be pulling of the electrons towards one side or the other. The last thing that I did was I just went over some visual examples. It's very important to be visual when you look at chemistry. All right, so you can see on the right, I've explained why the CH4 is symmetrical and therefore nonpolar. And then I've also, given three examples, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, where the bonds are nonpolar because each of those atoms is of the same element and therefore it has the same electronegativity. On the other hand, I put in some tempting uh, choices that actually end up polar. Now, both of these are polar because 
while they have symmetry in one direction, they don't have it in the other. We take the first example, it has vertical symmetry, right? I can cut right through the middle there, and we've got the same structure on the right and the left. However, if I cut through the middle horizontally instead, we only see the oxygen atom on top. Therefore, we know there's going to be a pull on top that's different from the pull in the bottom, hence a polar bond. Finally, when it comes to NH3, we have vertical symmetry. Again, we don't have horizontal symmetry here. So we can see that there's going to be activity um, in the bottom region that's different from the top, resulting in a polar bond. Again, I can tell you the nitrogen has a higher electronegativity than, than the hydrogen. And we can look all these things up in the periodic table of elements. Uh, and therefore, the, the electrons are going to be pulled closer towards the nitrogen, meaning the outer area is going to have an overall positive charge, and the inner area will have an overall negative charge. Final thing I want to do in this video is just take a quick look at the independent work questions that we have and talk about negotiating them. So I'm going to skip over the long explanation in the previous slide and go straight to this. So when we talk about the number of electrons shared between the sulfur atoms in this long bond, you want to try to not get intimidated. And remember that when we use dashed lines to represent bond pairs, each one of those bond pairs represents two electrons, all right? Now, the next thing that we would have to do is look at our periodic table of elements and make sure that we remember that when it comes to sulfur, we know that it has six electrons in its outer shell. I'm sorry, that's really tiny. I'm gonna zoom in. So if we go over here to sulfur, we can see from the electron configuration that it has six electrons in its outer shell. Now, if I go back to this diagram, I can see uh, there's a bond pair with carbon on one side for each of these sulfurs, all right? And so each of these sulfurs is sharing one electron and gaining one electron through sharing with that carbon atom. That means that each one is getting has a total of seven if you include the six that it has already and the one that it's sharing with the carbon. So it needs one more, and that's what it's getting right here. I'm going to circle that area. OK, so there's a single bond pair between them. So you want to think, well, wait a minute. If there's a single bond pair, how many electrons are being shared only between sulfur atoms? I'm going to leave that to you to answer it. Now, just to look at the other two really quickly, you want to think when we identify the polarity of an HI bond versus SS bond, we're going to compare electronegativities. One more time, back to the periodic table. If I'm comparing hydrogen, I see its electronegativity in table S, all right? So hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2. Iodine, which is I, has an electronegativity of 2.7. So we know there's a difference between them. On the other hand, sulfur has an electronegativity of 2.6, but both of the atoms in the sulfur bond are of the same element. So you want to think to yourself, what have we been studying about atoms bonded that are of the same element versus atoms bonded that are of different elements and different electronegativities? And that's going to guide your answer. Final thing, explain in terms of electron configuration why sulfur atoms and oxygen atoms form compounds with similar molecular structures. OK, so we could build a similar molecular structure to this dimethyl disulfide uh, between carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as well. That's what they're saying there. Again, we want to look at the periodic table and note that if we go over to group 16, oxygen and sulfur are in the same family. What does that mean? Well, it means something about their electron configuration. All right, so we see 2-6 for oxygen. We see 286 for sulfur, all right? And I hope that is enough to get you going. Hopefully this has been helpful. The takeaway that I wanna give you at the end of all of this is that chemistry often is both difficult and simple because the same patterns that you learn
when you study trends in the periodic table uh, and behavior uh, of certain elements based on where they're placed in the periodic table, those things come back again and again, and they come back all over the place uh, in a way that I've hopefully illustrated when it comes to bonding. I hope this has been helpful and I will talk to you soon.